I, I am a lawyer and the CEO of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I've been with AAP for about 15 years now, and uh, child health has been on the forefront of the Academy's agenda since its founding in 1930. The AAP is celebrating its 90th anniversary uh, this year, and so we're excited to talk about that and to keep the agenda moving forward. I have nothing to disclose. I only work for the AAP. As I said, the Academy is a unique medical society. The mission of the organization is a dual mission to protect uh, the health, well-being, optimal uh, uh, life and circumstances of all children, as well as the professional needs of its members. As I said, uh, the AAP is celebrating its 90th birthday this year, and our core values, I'll just read you the first one, uh, we believe in the inherent worth of all children. They are our most enduring and most vulnerable legacy. Uh, that children uh, of all ages and stages, from, be, be, from birth to young adulthood, are worth fighting for. And they need advocates uh, like us because they can't speak for themselves in so many circumstances. Like everyone, we have a plan, a strategic plan to keep going, but the core work of what we think is necessary for AAP to be doing this time is education, whoops, education, policy, and advocacy. I'm gonna speak uh, mostly about advocacy today, but of course we do all the rest as well. So let's settle in on some basic data together. Um, this is a quick snapshot of data on children's special health care needs. About 14.6 million children under the age of 18 have special health care needs. That's about almost 20 percent. Uh, the highest percentage is in children age 12 to 17. The lowest percentage is preschool kids birth to age 5. So the range is 11.4 percent to 25.1 percent uh, of, of any kind of special health care need. Uh, more boys than girls. Are, uh, have special health care needs, and the prevalence of special health care needs vary among income groups. So below 100% of the federal poverty level, it's at 16%, uh, between 101, 15.4, and 15% above. So there are intervening factors in uh, social factors in special health care needs as well as, as the medical uh, and, and other factors. Uh, all clinicians and health care systems are or will be caring for patients with developmental disabilities. All clinicians and all healthcare systems are now or will be at some point caring for patients with developmental disabilities. One in five, as I mentioned, has a special health care need. One in six children has a developmental disability. One in four adults have a disability of some kind. And so the basic notion here is that if you build a system of care that meets the need of individual with disabilities, it will also meet the needs of the people who don't have disabilities. If you design a system that meets the needs of those populations, then you're okay with everybody else. And so why not, why not design into that group to meet uh, the needs that they have? And here's the point. This is a chart uh, drawn by a mother of a, a young child who had a medically complex uh, condition. And this is a colorful uh, pictogram of her interactions with her environment. Let's see if I can get a pointer here. This is not a surprise to you if you work in this space, but it tells the story in a powerful way to me. So this is school. She's all of the special ed, PT, OT, nurse, out of district school, the bus driver, dispatch, district coordinator, transportation, developmental assessments, neuropsych, speech, OT, the healthcare system, the dentist, the specialist, primary care, pediatric practice, the pediatrician and referrals, specialty, hospital medication and equipment, family and professional partnerships. So all of the advocacy work that helps get all these things moving together. Out in the community, town recommendations, town rec center, uh, legal and financial, trust and estates, the attorney, the family planner, educational consultants, and then family, neighbors, friends, support groups, therapists, siblings, and the needs of the family. This is too much to ask. This is too much to ask for every parent or caregiver of a child with a special health care need or a family member of an adult with a special health care need to navigate alone. So imagine a system where you would design the entire system of care 
with the family at the center and thinking from a systems approach about how to be what the family needs when they need it in the way that they need it. To reimagine a future where the systems follow the family, the family doesn't adapt to the system. And that's the advocacy opportunity that is going to be necessary at every stage, every piece, every color, and every bubble from the mom's chart. And that's our opportunity to think in those systems ways, no matter what little bubble of my mom's chart that we stand in. How do I interact with other people, and how can I influence the system to circulate around the family as opposed to figure out how to deal with me? That's the excitement, that's the opportunity, and that's the incredible challenge that we have because this is super hard. You know this, right? There's, there's a lot of nodding. I almost, like there was almost like a, say it, <laughs> over there in the corner, there's like, yeah, please do it. Um, so that's the opportunity to think at the systems level. So to implement a system of services for children and youth with special health care needs, I'm gonna talk about that, but this is also um, adaptable and, and transferable to adult systems as well. So how do you think about the macro level, the, the top level of the system? So organizing and financing services by coordinating eligibility determinations, ensuring flexible funding streams, providing programmatic responsibility and accountability of service provision. So to think about designing these systems to work together. Clean sheet of paper, start over, work together with the family in mind. That's not so easy because we're talking about the Social Security Administration, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, federal and state Medicaid agencies, private health insurance, mental health and substance abuse providers, SSI, education, social services. Woof. Those systems are hard to interact with individually, much less as a system, much less trying to change them. That's the macro. Bringing it down then to the community level or the micro level. How do we create an operational, interagency, collaborative set of relationships that families can access services when they need them? A just-in-time approach. Governing structures that are tailored to local needs but operate under broad state and federal guidelines to ensure accountability and universality of access. So local tailoring, but a system that works and has a bare set of minimum standards. You like this slide because you're taking pictures of it. That's good. That's always a good, that's a good indication for me that it's good. Um, uh, feel free. And we'll send the slides too. You can, you can have them all. But that's to interact with community level service systems, physicians and healthcare, local schools, social services providers, uh, and families. That's the piece that feels a little less overwhelming than Social Security, SSI, the entire educational system, but not easy, not, not in any way uh, simple. But imagine if we interacted with families the way that Amazon interacts with us, just as a thought exercise. Amazon sends me an email about books I want to buy that I don't even know yet. <laughs> These are the books you want and you don't even know. They understand me so well that they're anticipating my needs. Now that's, none of us are billionaires. Well, I don't know, raise your hand if you're a billionaire. Uh, none of us are billionaires and so that's a pretty high level of service. But at the very least, interacting with Amazon is simple, intuitive, not challenging in, in the main. There's always exceptions. But you know what you're doing. Their services are constantly improving. What used to be like amazing that they could get it to that you're there in five days, then it got to be two days, and now it's like it arrived before you even finished clicking that. You know, the guy's standing there, here. You know, I mean, so, so imagine if, if we oriented ourselves around families in the way that they, Amazon orients itself around us. Are you getting the idea of what I'm saying? So this is not easy, but I think if we can align around the vision, then it gives us a set of advocacy opportunities to think through.
And this is important that we do it. Because the data on family caregivers uh, is something that I think we need to grapple with more directly and more deeply than perhaps we're able to do right now. 40 million family caregivers provide unpaid care at about a value of $470 billion annually to adults who help, need help with daily activities. $470 billion is almost, it's half a trillion dollars. 3.7 million family caregivers provide care to a child under age 18 because of a medical, behavioral, or other condition or disability. So they just step in and provide care. That's almost 4 million people. 6.5 million people do both. And so are we surprised that when you study family caregivers, you find that there are physical, emotional, and financial challenges? That they commonly experience emotional strain, mental pro health problems, especially depression. They have poorer physical health than non-caregivers. They're not recognized as caregivers or included in planning and care delivery and that they're finding and coordinating fragmented services is taking up all their time. The colorful bubble chart. So this is, in my mind, one of the most urgent opportunities for advocacy that we have. It's very, very important for us to advocate for children with special health care needs and adults with disabilities, but to, ad to advocate strongly for family caregivers the sort of silent people working so hard all the time is a huge chance for us to make a real difference. Uh, imagine the federal program that would provide $470 billion to provide that care that's currently being provided for free. So at AAP, we have some ideas about this. Families must not only take part in the system that they are a part of, they should be a part of system redesign, and they should be helping guide system redesign. So our principles for fi fa family engagement are that uh, families are principal caregivers and, this, and a center of strength and support. So when you're talking about families, they are the center of the dialogue, particularly for young children, but even for older um, children, young adults, and including some adults. Patients and families are partners in the healthcare system. The notion that they're patients receiving, they're the object of care as a part of a participant in, in that care uh, is a paradigm shift that we need in medicine. That we recognize and value the diversity among patients, families, and pediatricians. We build on the strengths of children and families and empower them to communicate their strengths. We encourage and support family engagement in education, practice, research, and advocacy. This is printed and above my desk in the headquarters of the AAP in Itasca, Illinois. Because everything about the work of the daily system drives you away from this. And so you have to pull yourself back into rethinking about families and systems um, all the time. We have built a, a, a a wonderful um, cadre of family uh, experts to help us with this. Uh, it's called the AAP Family Partnerships Network. And this is a group of families, parents, caregivers, uh, youth uh, that uh, we work with to help us figure out how to navigate all the things that I just said on the previous slide. So they support and inform the work of the Academy and our member pediatricians. They're, they're, they're radicals in some way. They're just sort of out of the box by, by nature. You know, why is, it, why is this happening this way? Why can't it be different? And challenge us to think in new ways and new perspectives, to roll that out as a set of standards of family engagement across our work at, as an organization, to provide input uh, and, uh, and guidance on strategic priorities for the organization going forward, 
uh, to give a different perspective on our policy statements, on all our clinical reports, on the publications that we make, the initiatives. This family engagement is uh, an integrated participant in all of that. And then it, all those core things I mentioned at the very beginning, policy advocacy and research, they're at the table and a part of that. This work is transformational and it's very hard. Uh, because to do the sort of systems changing that is necessary requires the fundamental sort of rethinking of a number of ways that we do engagement. For example, we have added um, family reviewers to the journal, our journal Pediatrics, and listening to families read peer-reviewed literature and try to understand what this, what does this say, what does this mean, and what, you know, you guys are really interested in p-values and uh, all of that, but what does this mean for us? And how do we uh, communicate that better? It's changing the way that we think, but changing the way that we talk. And it's, uh, it's incredibly exciting. It's, it's really fun, but not so easy. Okay, so that's laid all the foundation. We got work to do uh, together, but we, can't, we can do it. And the way to make the changes in these broad system approaches, whether it's our own institutions or in the community at the state or at the federal level, is advocacy. And in, in today's times, I think people worry about doing advocacy, uh, that somehow it feels like political or inappropriate in some way, uh, that, or, or dangerous, you know, that it's risky to engage in advocacy. Let me um, reassure you right away that you are already doing advocacy. Because that you, you are here, you are in this field, you are doing this work, too bad you're doing advocacy already. So you're already in the game, you already are everything you need to be, so how do you take one step forward? How do you take one step to the left, one step to the right, and keep moving? So advocacy is a continuum that you've already started on because you could have picked a much easier field. This is your problem, you did this, I did not. So welcome to the process, let's go. Let's join hands together uh, and start to move the dial for the people that we take care and care about. Look already at what advocacy has accomplished. I mean, at the legislative side alone, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Mental Health Parity, the ABLE Act, the Affordable Care Act, pushing Social Security to have rules and systems that are more friendly to people living with disabilities across um, uh, all kinds of federal agencies, sometimes standing up to stop undermining programs that benefit people with disabilities, efforts to repeal the ACA. It can be a lot of different things. I'm, this is a federal slide, but you can think about this at the state level, you can think about this at the community level, you can think about this in your own institution, but we can do big things. We can make big changes uh, for, for people. So, okay, here's a few ideas about how. Julius Richmond uh, was a pediatrician and Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, he was a very, very short man with a very, very powerful intellect. And he uh, was, was well known about uh, raising the alarm about secondhand smoking when he was a Surgeon General. He's a famous guy. And he said, in order to change public policy, you need scientific knowledge, a social strategy, and political will. So you need to have some data, you need to have some people behind you, and you need to have a plan for how to connect those data and those people to actual change. Now Julius Richmond is, uh, a, was a giant uh, in pediatrics and a super smart guy. I'm just a storefront lawyer, and so I do it a lot simple. I say, hope is not a strategy hoping that people will figure it out and do it better is not a strategy to change it. So in my mind, there are just four parts to any advocacy strategy that you would contemplate at any level. And if for those of you who have children, they deploy these tools against you at all times, and so you recognize these points as I will go through them. So now you know. 
from the person who is, has been for many years in charge of constructing federal strategy for a national organization, these are the four parts to any strategy, no matter what strategy it is, at what level. Easy. First, who is in charge? Who is the decision maker that can help you solve the problem, fix the issue, improve the situation, whatever it is that you're trying to do? Who is the decision maker? This is not so easy because sometimes it's complicated or there are many of them. And so some organized thought about who is in charge of this issue, who do I need to get? So if I'm trying to get a bill through the state legislature, maybe I don't need to go to all the state legislators, but I do need the chair of the relevant committee. If I'm trying to get something done in Medicaid, I don't have to talk to the governor, I have to talk to the Medicaid director. So sort of thinking through who is the decision maker. If you work in a hospital, is it the hospital administrator? Is, the, is it the chief of medicine? Who, who is the decision maker? Not always um, so clear. Secondly, nobody does advocacy alone. Everything in advocacy is a, is a coalition activity. So who are the partners that agree with you about this? Find somebody. You know, the data is very, very clear that if you have a gym buddy, you go to the gym a lot more, right? So if someone's calling like, oh, you're going? No, I don't want to go. Yeah, let's go. And then tomorrow you're going to want to go and they don't want to go. You know, find a partner because I'm suspecting that very few people in this room are being paid to do advocacy. So you're going to be wedging this in into your day job, into your evenings, and into your weekend. And if you have a buddy who can help you think about this, that makes it a lot easier. Sometimes it's a buddy, sometimes it's a huge coalition of organizations. Sometimes it's how, how is your organization working with a bunch of other organizations to solve the problem, make it, make it better. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work recently at the Academy of Pediatrics on vaping, which is a horrible uh, public health crisis. But there is seven or eight major national organizations that sit around a table together all the time to construct strategy and, and work hard to do something about vaping. We can't do it alone, and we're pretty big ourselves, but we, we need partners. Finding the partners is part two, but this, but this second item has two parts. Build the coalition and set the goal. The hard part sometimes when you have coalitions is that you see the problem from different perspectives. And so aligning around what is the one thing that you're going to solve together can sometimes take a lot of work. So do you want to solve this problem or that problem or this aspect of that problem and negotiating together what's the point? What is the overall goal that you're having is an intentional set of activities that you have to do in advance. What is, we all have different perspectives about this. What do we want to solve together? We're not trying to boil the ocean here. We're trying to solve this one problem. What does that look like? And that's not always so easy. Secondly, third, sorry, have a plan. So I'm talking about an intentional written agreed upon plan. We're going to go talk to this person. We're going to go engage the media in this way. We're going to get on Twitter. We're, whatever the plan is to be really intentional about what that looks like and so that you can hold yourself accountable to the plan. And then third, craft a message and speak out. The message piece is also challenging. So the goal is hard. The plan is important and the message is key. So I'll give you uh, an example of where healthcare professionals can sometimes struggle to craft a clear message. When I say the weight of the currently available evidence does not suggest a causal relationship between neurodevelopmental disorders and routine childhood immunizations, you know exactly what I mean. Right? To everyone else, that sounds like you're hiding something and you're probably lying. <laughs> the way that health professionals talk to each other is not how people talk to each other. The way that scientists, people in, in scientific fields talk to each other is not normal. It's not how people talk to each other. If I say vaccines don't cause autism, got it. Simple declarative sentence. Easy to go, easy, ready to go. And so crafting that message is very, very important. I find that sometimes people who work with uh, children and people work with uh, families and others with 
in, in the special healthcare needs context or in disabilities context actually are a little better at this than others because people who spend their time explaining complicated things to people all day know how to explain complicated things to people. So if, if, you, if, you're a, if you're a family bringing your sick child to a pediatrician, you're at a high emotional state, this is your child, and what the pediatrician says has to be clear and, and convincing. It, it can't be sort of, yeah, there's a bunch of studies about this and we're sort of thinking about that. Say, Does my child have coronavirus or not? Right? Should my child go to school or not? And so the way to craft messages in advocacy is not how you talk to each other, it's how you talk to families how you talk to patients, how you talk to the people you provide services to. That's really tough because if you're asking, if someone has asked you to go testify in front of a state legislative committee, you want to bring your A game, your professional game. Right? You want to bring the data, you want to bring the evidence. But the policymakers who are up there are much more like families than they are like you. And so crafting the message in simple uh, terms is really, really challenging but crucially important um, as a part of it. So this is it. You could do this. Four parts. Advocacy. And you should. Because physicians, nurses, allied professionals, anybody interacting with people with disabilities or children with special health care needs are experts in a way that nobody else is. You know the needs in the way that nobody else does. You live in the rules of practice and payment and the systems that are broken and need improvement like nobody else does. You have the true, real stories to tell, and so you should tell them. And half of advocacy is just telling those stories. Joining together with patients, self-advocates, and families, professionals of all kinds, medical societies and organizations, we can team up to make a difference. When you're working through your four-part plan, these are the populations of people to sort of think about. You know, who, who, who needs to be a part of these coalitions with you? Um, we need to have people at the table who are affected by every decision and policy that's made, and we need to lift their voices up too. Politics is a, is a, um, is a people business. It's a stories business. It's not medicine. Uh, if, if policy making at every level was evidence based, we'd have much different policy. Right? You agree with this. If it was just about convincing people what the data was, we'd have totally different policies. But it's not. It's about compelling people to believe in a different kind of future, to create a new change. And telling stories is about that. It puts a face to an issue. It paints a picture of how people are really affected. It puts the, the audience, the listener, in the shoes of the person as, of the experience. And it takes it out of dry statistics uh, in a way that is compelling. Uh, a legislator in Maine, a state legislator in Maine, told me one time that the most effective meetings that she has, uh, the structure of those meetings are heart Heart, head, heart. Let me tell you about a person in our community that I, I want to share with you about. Here's how that person is connected to everyone else. That's the data. And we really want to do something for that person. So help me. Heart, head, heart. Okay. So if you have five minutes over the next couple of days, next couple of weeks, think about a patient story in your mind. Watch the news, listen to the radio with this frame how does this affect patients with developmental disabilities? If you're on Twitter or social media, post something about that, a thought. Get involved. Check a website. Do something. Five minutes. Just take a step. If you have 30 minutes, set up a Google News Alert. Do you know what those are? Those are real handy. Uh, you can go into Google, put some search terms in a news alert, and it will mine the news for you and send you news articles about the topics that you like. And so set up a Google News Alert with the keywords about the work that you do or the populations that you care about most and see, how, uh, see, how it com see what comes back. Maybe that will spur you to do a letter to the editor or respond in social media in some way, contributing to the conversation with that data. If you have an hour, you can write a letter to the editor. You can write an opinion editorial for a local paper or an online blog. 
you can give professional grand rounds or new conference or something on advocacy in the organization or community that you participate in. You can write an advocacy article. Uh, feel free, hope is not a strategy. Sh sh uh, repeat, repeat, repeat. Steal that shamelessly, no attribution required uh, if you find it useful and share. It is possible to make big change and we have to. So this is the 115th and 116th Congress of the United States. This is 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. So for those of you who think nothing good has happened in Washington in the last few years, I'm not trying to disabuse you of that notion, but I am telling you that we have moved the ball on some very big things. This is not in the news, right, because it's not controversial, so you wouldn't hear about it. But we have reauthorized the Autism Cares Act. We've reauthorized early hearing, detention, and intervention. The PREMI Act, Congenital Heart Futures Act, those are previous pieces of legislation that we reauthorized. We passed Kevin and Avante's law for children who wander. The Raise Family Caregivers Act. We can do big things even in hard times. And so we should. And you all, as healthcare professionals, have a voice like no other. So this is a Gallup poll. You know Gallup, they do, they do polling. Uh, I've been following this Gallup poll for a very long time, and it's very important. The question that they asked people in this poll is, please tell me how you would rate the honesty and ethical standards of people in these different fields. So the question is honesty and ethical standards. Very high, high, average, low, or very low. So the light green, the lightest green on the left is very high, the middle is average, darker green is very low, and no opinion is the one on thing. Okay, I know this is hard for you to see in the back, so I'm going to help you. Members of Congress <laughs> are dead last in the poll. 8% of people think that their honesty and ethical standards of people is very high. high. Members of Congress are before are below car salespeople, telemarketers. <laughs> Lawyers are somewhere in the bottom quartile, I would say. Um, I don't disagree with that, frankly, but we could talk about that at the break. <laughs> Here's clergy in the middle. Here. Look at the top three, nurses, medical doctors, and pharmacists. Isn't that something? The highest trusted professions by Americans are health professions. The, embrace this, the power of your voice. The authenticity and credibility that people hold you to. It's almost like it's a mistake not to use it. To not be an advocate is to waste it. So to take that credibility um, and use it because the people that we care about need you to do that. And I will end with the two most perfect specimens of human life. Um, this is my niece Avery and my nephew Parker. Um, they have now set the bar for human babies, male and female, uh, about which all other babies will be measured. Um, uh, for all time. That's an APGAR 11 and an APGAR 12 at birth. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at Avery, how can you not, right? Come on. Um, thank you so much for letting me come here. I appreciate that, and I will take questions. <laughs>